that's okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Augie, and I am the exhibit specialist here at Kansas City Public Library. And on behalf of the library, I would like to welcome you all tonight. We are so glad you could join us for what is still very much a timely conversation, service under stress, nursing in the era of COVID-19. This evening's discussion is co-sponsored by our good friends at Baptist Trinity Lutheran <laughs> Legacy Foundation and Kansas City's Medicine Cabinet. In conjunction with the exhibit, Called to Care, The Legacy of Trinity Lutheran Hospital School of Nursing, 1906 to 1972. This fantastic exhibit highlights an important history of a long-serving Kansas City teaching hospital, its legacy, and how the alumni continue to move this profession forward today and into the future. I would like to take a moment to give special thanks again to Beth Radke and Tammy Collingsworth from BTLLF, uh, also Jennifer Tufts, Steve Woolfolk, and Leslie Case for coordinating tonight's event and Teresa Wildhaber, the graphic designer for the exhibit, and Kate Carpenter, the exhibit historian, curator, and designer. If you have not taken time to view it already, Called to Care remains in Goldner Gallery on the first floor all the way to the back through December 2nd. And as always, uh, the library here is open 24-7 at kclibrary.org, and you can follow us on Instagram at kclibrary. So please stay connected to uh, virtually to learn more about upcoming events and exhibits. So thank you again tonight for joining us. And now please welcome the chairman of the board of directors for Baptist Trinity Lutheran Legacy Foundation, Harley Metcalf. Thank you. Well, I currently serve as the chairman of the board for Baptist Trinity Lutheran Legacy Foundation. In 2003, Baptist Trinity Lutheran Legacy Foundation became a private charity. Because of the closure of Baptist Medical Center and Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Today, the foundation carries on the work of the hospital's foundations through short term medical assistance, continuing medical education, health care grants to schools and scholarships. In September, the foundation was privileged to open the exhibit Called to Care, Trinity Lutheran Hospital School of Nursing, 1906 to 1972, here in the Goldner Gallery on the first floor. The goal in doing so was to honor the alumni of the 50th anniversary of their final graduating class, to elevate the profession of nursing, and to shine a light on the ongoing work they were doing to support the future of nursing through their scholarship fund. To date, this fund has provided 793 scholarships, equaling $2.5 million in scholarships to worthy nursing students. We want to thank the Kansas City Public Library for their support with this exhibit. We encourage you to spend some time viewing this retrospective look on nursing in the 1900s through the lens of the Trinity Lutheran Hospital School of Nursing. We hope you'll find it as educational and inspirational as we did. It truly is. Tonight, we are honored to continue our celebration of the nursing profession with the program Service Under Stress, Nursing in the Era of COVID-19. We are honored to have Dr. F. Patrick Robinson, president of the Research College of Nursing, who will be speaking on our topic tonight and leading discussion with our panel of COVID-19 pandemic frontline workers. Thank you for your service. I don't know what we'd do without you. Joining him this evening on our panel are Pat Connolly, Clinical Nurse Coordinator, Progressive Care Unit, Research Medical Center, Stephanie Berger, Nurse Manager, Progressive Medical Telemetry Unit, the University of Kansas Health System, Mate Enrique, Associate Dean, Research College of Nursing, Julie Philbeck, Chief Nursing Officer, Research Medical Center, Loretta Rawlings, Clinical Nurse Coordinator, Research Medical Surgical Intensive Care and Faculty Member at Penn Valley Community College, and Sherry Shadell, Senior Director, Advanced Practice Providers and Ambulatory Services for Children's Mercy Hospital. This is a very timely event. The past couple of years, as we were speaking earlier, seemed like they've been a blur in the healthcare industry. I'm a healthcare worker myself. Without the dedication and the perseverance that these folks have shown, 
I don't know where we'd be right now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robinson, because he has some very, very timely comments for us. Well, good evening, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. And to everyone online, uh, welcome as well. I have the privilege of interviewing some real heroes tonight. And uh, they're the real stars of this show. So I'm just going to start with some prefatory remarks, putting what our discussion in context. So over the last three years, our sense of time has really been altered. In fact, the other day I was speaking to a colleague and I said, last year, and she looked a little bit confused at me and asked some clarifying questions. And I realized I was actually talking about something that happened in 2019. And I shared that experience with a friend of mine and she said that happens to her all the time. And in fact, she's used to now adding a year or two onto her recollections in the hope of getting it right. And I see some nodding heads, so you know that that is an experience that's common to all of us. So that time warp is just one of the many consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. For all of us, I think it is incredibly difficult to comprehend what the last 32 months have been. In fact, the pandemic has really been one of those defining historic epics, like World War II, the assassination of MLK and JFK, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and 9-11. Just like those, there will always be a time before the pandemic and after, and the way that we think and our ways of being will forever be altered because of it. Now, we are not post-pandemic, but certainly there are aspects of late 2022 that look more like 2019 than did 2020 or 2021. For many, and I was one of them, the pandemic was a major inconvenience. But for others, it was an immense tragedy. The US statistics stand at 97 million cases with just over a million deaths. So to put that in perspective, that's more people than have died of AIDS-related complications over the last four decades. Now, as someone who lived, worked, and nursed exclusively in that earlier pandemic for almost two decades, I concur with what Stephen Thrasher wrote earlier this year in Scientific America. He said, it is significant and worrying to see four decades of such grief compressed into less than two years. How can US society process a scale of grief so quickly, especially when COVID has allowed far fewer norms of collective mourning? What was true in that earlier pandemic is certainly true in this pandemic, and that's that nurses are central players in it. While COVID, while many during COVID sheltered in place, nurses and other healthcare workers charged forward with the inability out of sense of obligation and the nobility that is our profession had no other, they had no other choice. And it's hard even in this short time period since the beginning of the epidemic, because so much has evolved, to remember how much uncertainty there was in the early days of the pa pandemic. You know, it wasn't even clear at the beginning what type of isolation we should put these patients in. PPE was in short supply, and I'm always fascinated that now the world knows what PPE means. <laughs> 
In 95, another thing that kind of fascinates me when I hear everyone talk about in 95s, um, you know, masks were used, single use masks were used for a shift, multiple shifts, or sometimes weeks, depending on how the um, supply was. And healthcare workers didn't know whether or not they were going to die by taking care of COVID patients, nor if they were going to put their families at risk of dying. Then there were those haunting images that we're all used to, the scarred faces of nurses from hours of mask wearing and goggles. And those haunting images also of healthcare workers having to talk to their babies and their toddlers through windows and through sliding glass doors. The impact on individual nurses and the nursing workforce as a whole has been substantial. Let's start with the workforce. At the beginning of the pandemic, nurses were heralded as heroes, and rightfully so. Now, kind of some of us new nurses were already heroes, but it's still nice to know that the world kind of understands that now. Marvel Comics even did a special issue of a comic book that highlighted uh, nurses as um, heroes. Initially, during the start of the pandemic, applicants to nursing schools rose uh, precipitously, and the data from our data reporting agencies um, showed that we did have increases in nursing school enrollment, enrollment because of that halo effect of heroes. That is no longer the case. I can tell you that at my institution and in talking to my colleagues around the country, that there are strong headwinds for the first time in decades in terms of, of people wanting uh, to be um, nurses. The effects of not having adequate PPE during the onset of the pandemic did force some nurses to resign to retire, and unfortunately to leave the profession altogether, which only exacerbated what already in some places is a critical shortage of our workforce. There is evidence, true or not, that nurses felt betrayed by their management and the public at large who lauded them, but yet seemed to not prioritize their safety. Now, probably everyone in this room knows about the um, nursing shortage, and it's still too early to have good predictive models to understand how phenomenon that is affecting other industries, such as the great resignation, and in our industry, the shift towards staffing agencies will impact the um, nursing shortage, both in the long term and in the short term. But the anecdotal evidence, and I'm sure our panelists can speak to this, is that the impact seems to be great. So we're in trouble. Feeding into the nursing workforce issues is the impact on individual nurses. Compassion fatigue amongst nursing is, was already a growing problem. And COVID-19 only exacerbated that. And it is likely that compassion fatigue has been the major contributor to the burnout that we're seeing experience across the nation and the world, actually, amongst nurses. If you're not familiar with that term, compassion fatigue describes the physical, emotional, and psychological impact of helping others. And it's usually helping others through periods of stress and trauma. And witnessing that and caring for individuals experiencing trauma and severe stress is called secondary traumatic stress. So think for a minute about the trauma that my colleagues to my right witnessed during the pandemic. Just two come to mind to me. First, patient isolation which means having to cluster care to minimize exposure. 
Talk about something that is against everything we are as nurses. We dwell with patients. We're with them. We touch them. So it's the opposite of everything that we were drawn to nursing for. And then also the disruption, witnessing the disruption of the natural grieving process. We as nurses take pride in providing for and caring for people during good death. It's one of our goals of care. Saying goodbye to a parent, a child, or a spouse via an iPad is anything but a good death. These traumatic happenings feed the feelings of failing as nurses, especially in the areas of advocacy and support, as well as inadequacy, um, because there simply wasn't treatment too much of the early days of the pandemic. So that's a little bit of context about clinical nursing during the height of the pandemic. And now I'm happy to um, introduce some stories to you through my colleagues. So if you would all come up here and uh, join me. So, first of all, thank you all, not only for being here tonight, um, but for everything you've done. You're certainly um, heroes to all of us. I hope that that wasn't too um, deep and dark uh, for you. You obviously are all survivors and have re re resilience. So what I'm going to ask when you answer a question is because you weren't able to be identified by who you were. Pat has her name tag on, um, so we know which one she is. <laughs> uh, tell us uh, who you, well, actually, why don't we do that? Why don't we start so people know your name and your affiliation and what you do? My name is Stephanie Berger. I'm a nurse manager at the University of Kansas Health System on an acute progressive care unit. Hi, my name is Sherry Shadell. I'm a, um, well, I'm at Children's Mercy Hospital, so I'm pediatrics my entire career. I'm a senior director of ambulatory surgical services and the advanced practice nurse practitioners. So my name's Maite Enriquez. Uh, right now I'm the associate dean at Research College, but that's not the reason I'm on the panel. <laughs> um, so those of you who know me know I'm an infectious disease nurse practitioner. And when COVID hit in March of 2020, I went back to clinical practice full time. So research allowed me to do that, to do uh, direct patient care with my ID colleagues. Hi, I'm Loretta Rawlings, and I work at Research Medical Center. I am a charge nurse in the surgical and medical ICU. I also teach for Penn Valley. <laughs> Good evening. I'm uh, Julie Philbeck. I'm the chief nursing officer at Research Medical Center. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to be here tonight. Hello, I'm Patricia Conley. I go by Pat, and I'm honored to be here. And I work in a progressive care unit, which is a step-down ICU, and I'm a clinical nurse coordinator for Research Medical Center. Okay. So we, we might, we probably should share that research became, um, what do we want to call it, the hub? The hub. So yeah, we. Everyone, all the patients with COVID, correct me if I'm wrong, were transferred to research from our um, we have a nine sister hospitals. We have a nine hospitals. And so the, yeah, the hospital was all COVID. I mean. You're like the Mecca of COVID treatment. Yeah. yeah. That's something. But you're wondering why research is overrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> So go, let's take us back to the beginning. So take us back to February, early um, March. Um, when did you know there was a coming storm? Well, I knew before that. Mm -hmm. Just because of the news and what was going on on social media, I knew it was coming. I can remember our very first patient at Research Medical Center. When uh, was that? Uh, I think it was late February, early March. I remember the room, I remember all of it. I remember the curiosity um, and the fear that everyone had. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, it was late February. Yeah, I think it 
okay it was like that. I think it was late February, because I remember my husband coming home and saying, we all need to put on masks. My husband's an infectious disease physician, for those of you who don't know me, so. <laughs> and he works at Research Medical Center. <laughs> so was it- Yes, we worked very close. <laughs> Was it generally known when the first, that COVID was in your hospitals? I mean, I know there's HIPAA, but. I don't think so. No. no. Ours was a little different. Yeah, I'm Children's please. Mercy. So we actually, I'm in a, a really different place than all of you. So we are learning because we're literally probably living what we consider the pediatric pandemic right now. Because as you know, COVID didn't affect children quite as significantly. It did affect us but not as significantly as it did adults. So, but our first case I know to the day was March 7th, March 15th they presented, March 17th they were diagnosed of 2020. Oh. For, that's the first child for us. How about? Yeah, I, it was communicated. Um, I think communication was huge during this and that they speak to the fear of the unknown that everyone experienced. Um, I think the level of communication was, was very helpful and that's something that we had and our, and our nursing teams had. And so it was, this is happening. There was avenues if you had questions or concerns as we started this journey. Um, and I think that was huge. And was there generally, um, everyone stepped up or did you have challenges in terms of getting people to charge forward? I'd like to speak to that. I think that there were many nurses that stepped up and it really brought out, you know, their integrity as nurses, as well as their resilience and their grit. And uh, I thought that was really, it was really astounding, you know. And I think, you know, with the CDC always trying to keep up with it, there were all these changes and they were, um, I felt that administration and management was always trying to address each one of those changes. And it, it, it was sometimes challenging because, you know, one day it'd be one way and then very quickly it would change, you know, and that's exactly how it was. And you see, so you really had to, it was very fluid and you had to be flexible. I love what you just said because one of the things that I still remember about the very beginning was deploying staff to, we set up tables for people to get screened as they walked in mm -hmm. and you started talking about, and I remember deploying some care assistants to go to those tables and they put on masks because that at that point we didn't know, mask, not mask, conserve mask, don't conserve, you know, and so the decision that first day was no mask because we were actually scaring people more by sitting there with masks on, you know in igniting fear and, and anxiety. So telling them, you know, you, you can't wear a mask and then having those conversations, then to only turn around and be like, you have to have, have to masks on. It was really, it really keeps me up at night as, as leadership because you're trying to build trust and there's nothing harder than building trust in spite of significant fear for everybody, really. Yeah, absolutely. So what was one of the at what point did you realize that things were really bad? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I can speak to that. Yes. <laughs> so probably third, third week of March, maybe the, the last week of March when we started getting kind of inundated. Um, I just know that the ICU and the physicians that were down there, we all became very close because we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know how to treat them. And we um, were all figuring it out as we went. And it was just, uh, I can't even explain how mm -hmm. um, it was. It was like we were at war. Mm -hmm. um, I still joke today, it's not really a joke, but I say it was like Baghdad. I mean, we were, you know, all the doors were shut. We had all the PP. we had, gowns hanging on the doors. Um, those long IVs. Those oh, long yeah. IVs. We had the IV poles outside with long um, inlines to the patients. Uh, it, was, it was just Baghdad. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of surreal. Don't it you was think? very surreal. Very surreal. Yeah, I think I'd echo that and then also add to that that, you know, we started very quickly to 
to, to run out of room to care for these patients. Mm -hmm. And so we had to get really creative in how are we gonna care for these higher acuity patients on, uh, I was on a progressive care floor, so how are we going to care for these patients um, on a progressive care floor that are requiring a lot of care. And so that's really where our shared governance came in and our nurses really got a huge voice. And so they really got to develop policies and protocols and really be involved in how we care for these patients. Um, and so it was really exciting and something that they're really proud of today. So that's something very positive that's come out of this, but also something that was very fearful and scary in the beginning. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah, I'd like to share maybe from a different perspective. So at the time that COVID first started, um, I actually wasn't in my current role at Research Medical Center. So I was actually working for our division um, team at that time as our VP of Nursing Operations. So I actually supported um, all of our hospitals in the Kansas City area, but also we um, at the time had hospitals um, in our system that were down in the New Orleans area. Um, and so Tulane Medical Center was part of our facility and I worked as a division team member um, in nursing operations to support them. And of course, um, one of the hardest hit areas right off the bat, um, of course, Mardi Gras plus 14 days. And um, they were just annihilated um, within a matter of about, um, mm -hmm. I wanna say probably three weeks, they went from about 10 patients to 108. And of course we had our incident command calls and um, you know, at the time, much of us in the Kansas City area, um, I know as a mom at that time, my kids were sent home from school, right? Um, my husband moved from work to home and was a homeschooling dad and working. I'm sure very many of you all experienced similar things, but um, right, we were in the middle of it. and but we didn't have the numbers right off the bat. And actually part of my work there was to help, um, there were several nurses from Research Medical Center because we didn't have the high population um, that I helped organize to send down to the New Orleans uh, market to sh have nurses assist with our sister facilities down there. And um, we learned a lot from them, um, but I will be honest, I think the rapid pace at which they got hit um, was very overwhelming because literally their numbers grew so quickly where I don't feel like we experienced it quite at rapid growth in the Kansas City um, area. Um, but no matter what, I don't, in any phase, right, we can talk about all the various phases of the various variants, et cetera. Um, it's still, I don't think any t at any point of those were we ever truly prepared, yeah. uh, to be real honest. But yeah, you rose to the occasion. You know, I think that's the thing, and I echo that. You know, Pat said that, Sherry, I know you said that, Stephanie, agree. I, I have never seen such amazing and talented people work the way that I think nursing as a profession has in the last two and a half to almost three years. Um, we will all be forever changed, right? Um, unfortunately, I think our families will we'll all be forever changed, um, some ways in good, in some ways maybe not, as you alluded to um, in the beginning. But I will also say uh, there's nothing else I'd rather do because I am truly proud to be a nurse and stand arm in arm with other nurses because I think it is what we're called to do. And it is our passion, as scary as it may be. So can someone share a story, um, a poignant story in terms of how with a patient that uh, forever impacted you. I know that when Mighty and I were talking in my office, she's like, I don't talk about this. And she kind of kept backing away. <laughs> but she didn't get to any specific stories. So, so what, what did you see and what stories do you want people to know that you witnessed? Well, there are so many. You know, it's really hard to, to pick one specific one. But... So I will pick one, um, it's one of many. Um, there were couples, we would get couples. And I was always so touched and impressed about everybody, we would try and keep them together. And we have this, um, one, these two rooms that are sort of like in a little ante room, so they're sort of together. And the one spouse that was always the better one, not as sick, would go, you know, they'd go, you know, you know, how do I say, waddling into the other room. We'd all be, oh my God, they're gonna fall. And they would go in and, you know, they would console their loved one and, you know, check on them and, you know, they comfort each other. And so that was always very touching. And then of course, you know, and then one of them would 
would likely die. And, and so that was always very painful, but it always made me feel good that we tried to do the most we could to have them, you know, spend some time together. So it was really, you know, I think that's very impactful and it's something that I'll always remember. Yeah, there were a lot of couples. I'm trying to remember this one couple. I can't remember if it was on your unit, Pat. I probably. I was, we were doing this study for a, a, a COVID test that didn't work out, but that's okay. We had to do it, right, <laughs> to know what did work. Yeah, and I remember coming in really early, and, yeah, we would have these couples, and we'd be afraid that one, we would lose one and not the other. And so I was there, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I thought, and the nurses were all going, no, no, no. <laughs> They went home. <laughs> it's okay, because I was like, like, so upset. And I was, so yeah, I forgot about that. The nurses were taking care of me, which was so nice. Which, yeah, it was, uh, it was rough. I remember seeing Pat many times going up mm -hmm. and down. I remember collaborating with you, uh, Pat, trying to get one of them from the ICU up to you oh. and with the other one because I, I remember one was coming down to see the one in the ICU and we were like they are gonna be together by God um, and we we did it yeah this is what nurses do I mean this is this is extraordinary nursing care well, we haven't talked about post COVID but I have a patient I'm still yeah. taking care of almost how long has it been two and a half years now and still having a whole lot of issues so you know, I think we forget some people are still, you know, they survived, but. Yeah, what is the incidence of that long hauler syndrome or do we even know? It's not, I don't, we, I don't see as many cases now with these newer variants or yeah. whatever we call them, but back in the day, a whole lot of people, it seemed like. Yeah. What was the most extraordinary thing you saw a colleague do during this time? <laughs> oh, it's a hard question because there's every day, yeah. I mean, there is something, everybody was going above and beyond every single day. And they mentioned couples. We saw a lot of families, you know, we had dads and sons and dads and daughters. And, you know, um, I can remember one family and the, the son was getting transferred to the ICU. And, you know, these patients were watching their fate play out on TV, right? Yeah. And so they would hear that. That's, that's a poignant. And they wouldn't want to go. And then you'd see just immediate hope kind of lose. And so it was, okay, well, how can we, you know, how can we make this work here? And we are very fortunate um, that we have a kind of like a sister ICU. And so that team was able to come over almost hourly that first day and provide an update and reassurance. And we were able to get our patient over there to see his son. But um, I think that was a, a scary piece of this too and something that our teams really had to handle quite a bit was turning off the TV maybe and, and kind of helping provide that positive perspective. Yeah, you don't think, I mean, I wouldn't have thought about that, but yeah, that was very poignant when you said they were seeing their lives played out on TV. Wow. wow. So, did you want to say something, Pat? I wanted to just add, you know, we had a family that they, you know, they only, only well, for in the very beginning, they didn't allow any visitors, and that, of course, right. was very hard. So, we had a family that all got together in the parking lot. We had the patient go to the window. They had signs and balloons, and they were waving, and and it was really, you know, it really cheered them up. And it was really, I thought it was really unique. You know, people got creative, mm -hmm. you know? So creative. <laughs> That's how I met my, fir my first grandchild, was Aww. my children holding the baby up in the window on the opposite end of seeing them. I mean, that's, yeah. that's how people went through it. They were so creative. Yes. But I saw the opposite side of that, which was, I'll never forget that. Okay, it was right. like Simba. In Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> so you've talked to, you've talked about your family a few times. So um, talk a little bit more. Did some of you have to stay for the special with some of you who have children? Did you stay out of the house at the beginning, like we saw on TV? Were I didn't stay out of the house. I um, I undressed 
in my garage. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I never took my shoes yeah. into the house at all. It, they stayed um, in a box in the back of my Jeep. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, I, I slept downstairs, and yeah. my husband slept upstairs. Um, the joy of my life is my five-year-old granddaughter, and I did not get to see her for about six to eight months, uh, which killed me, because that's where my happy lies. Mm -hmm. um, we all pulled many extra shifts. Yeah. Um, we all banded together um, in, at research to help these patients and try to take care of the families um, that are on the other end of the phone. Yeah. So, and there was a lot of that, wasn't oh, there? Oh, yes. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, we did the same thing. We didn't see our grandchildren for months and months. Yeah. What'd you, what did you say, Mike? I was going to say we did the same thing. We didn't see our grandchildren for months and yeah. months. They would come over and stand at the bottom of the yard, and we have this big deck, and we'd talk to them from the top of the deck. We had a because my driveway husband, meeting one time. Yeah, because my husband and I, I mean, and my husband was, like, really up close and personal with you know, the really, really sick folks. And we didn't know, you know, for a while. Yeah. After a while, we figured out, okay, it's not from our clothes, you know. It's, right, yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 you know. Remember on the news, they were telling us to wipe down our groceries. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was a And germ leave them outside. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I was already a germaphobe, so you can imagine. It's true, true. So, um... How in the world did you take care of yourselves and each other? I did it. Yeah. I took care of everyone but me. Not you. Um, how's that? Because how'd the, how'd I'm, that work out? Oh, it, it, it just worked great. <laughs> well, you know, since I'm a, a leader in the ICU, my main concern was my nurses. Yeah. Because they would take care of these patients for weeks and weeks, watching them decline slowly and get worse and worse. And we got to know their families, and the nurses were amazing. But oh, what a toll it took on them. Still today, yeah, I see it. It is all that yeah. that compassion fatigue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our coworkers really became our family during this time. And so we kind of had to take care of each other. And, um, you know, we would some we set up sometimes anonymous chats where we could all get on the phone and talk to someone, but it's anonymous. And we didn't necessarily have to say, this is me, I'm struggling with this. But just to talk through, because there is some, I mean, there is a lot, a lot of death that we're not really used to. And so we've done everything. And how can we help support each other in that? But... Um, we really became family with our coworkers during this time. And my assumption is that you were probably not untouched by COVID in your personal life somewhere. I mean, I, I became acutely aware of this in a staff meeting when everyone was, you know, was everything wasn't right. Well, everyone had lost someone at least one, like one degree relative from them. So, you know, like when you're, so I bet you were living it also in your personal life sometimes. And of course, the nurse is always the, um, the neighborhood um, expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's hard. You know, I just a couple of things I'd want to touch on with that. I think that, I think the hardest thing in particular in being in healthcare during that time frame was the public reaction to what was happening. Um, I think that was probably the hardest personal part to go through um, because you had the naysayers in the public and I wanted to just say, come walk a day with me. Uh -huh. um, come walk a day with me and see through my eyes what I see and then you make your decision um, about what is really happening in hospitals and what is really happening to these people and what is happening to our nurses, um, because I think that was the most difficult part is um, certainly you, you talked about that earlier, um, Patrick, about you know some of that anger. And um, I would truly be lying if I, if I told you I, I had let all that go, um, but I haven't. And, and for some relationships in my life maybe are not the same, yeah. because I, I don't think that I can ever express what the profession went through, and um, I need people, I needed people to know what we went through. And, you know, 
I, I will also say, you know, you, you asked that question about some of the things that you saw our colleagues do mm -hmm. um, throughout that time frame, and you know, I had to ponder that because I'll be honest with you, I could encyclopedic, I could, right? So many, so many stories, and you know, I recognize that I'm not even in the forefront of that every day, right? As a leader, and um, well, yes, I, you know, being in rooms and helping and those types of things, day in and day out for a 12-hour shift was not my role, right? I saw from afar. Um, what my team members, and, and particularly these two ladies, I can remember having conversations with you on Sunday nights about things that we needed to do differently for different patients um, and exceptions that maybe needed to be made because it was the right thing for a patient, which probably we snuck some people in the back doors that we probably shouldn't have, right? That's what we do. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's the thing is, is that, um, you know, Pat said that earlier, you had to be very fluid. And I think we had to figure out how to be fluid for the right thing for the patients. And I saw everything. Right. Um, so many, so many acts of kindness that you can't even describe that, um, you know, when you think about healthcare workers, I always share with newer nurses, you'll never realize how many part of stories of people's lives you will be, right? Because often they don't have an opportunity to tell you that. And just know that, that every action and interaction you have with a patient or a family, you are forever part of their story. And I think about not just the group that's up here today, but the profession of nursing and all those little things, the posters that were made, um, the chats on the iPads, the mm -hmm. stuffed animals that were bought at gift shops, mm -hmm. the, I, I can go on and on, the drawings on the windows, right? Whatever it was, taking patients to windows, um, taking them to doors so they could see family members, that is part of that family story forever. Well. Thank you all for representing the profession um, so well. Uh, you truly are heroes. So I think it's we can do some um, question and answer now from um, the audience. So um, Steve has a microphone. Yep. Um, if you have a question, because we're recording tonight, if I could just raise your hand and I'll bring this microphone to you and would appreciate it you uh, ask via the microphone. And this is for any or all of you. What do you feel is a good example of a patient or a family member expressing their extreme gratitude for everything that you had done for them? I would love to answer that. Well, I can tell you that, um, so Research Medical Center at some point, they did this a couple times, families would write these beautiful letters and they would uh, read them um, at a, you know, sort of the ceremony that they bought poinsettias that represented the lives lost to COVID. And it was really beautiful. Some of the letters were just very touching. Our, um, uh, it was Ashley read, you know, one of the letters in one of our meetings and it was really phenomenal. It was something I'll never forget because sometimes you think families, you know, don't really know what goes behind taking care of their loved one and, and their loved one dying. That it, it, There is a part of you in that, too. But they got it. We had families make us masks and make us face shields. Mm -hmm. uh, people made them. I still have the one I wore for a long, long time. At the beginning, it's orange. And it was made. Oh, I was going to say, we had, like, family, friends, people's families, making us masks and making us face shields. Trying to protect you. Because, Beautiful. you know, you couldn't, we didn't have enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I still have my orange face shield that was handmade. <laughs> and I wore it. Um, and then, of course, we got, then we had plenty of everything. But, but it was very touching to have people do that. Yeah, I'd echo just the thank yous. I think it was huge and the, the handwritten letters. I still see some on our staff's lockers of patients that they really got close to, families that they really got close to, and they're still holding on to those. And they read them every time they come to work. I totally second everything that everyone's saying. And I think the other thing is, is that they don't forget. Like for me, the letters I get now mm -hmm. are almost more touching than what I got in the moment because they still remember, so. I think remembering is is huge too. 
We had one patient that, um, I'm gonna try not to cry, because uh, he was 27. Um, he ended up being on ECMO, mm -hmm. and he was there for a, oh, I don't even know how long, months and months. Um, by that time, we were bringing some visitors in, um, and I think this was actually one of the times when I had <laughs> called her. <laughs> um, we wanted his babies to come see him, and we made that happen and because um, he was fully awake. Um, he just could not live without that ECMO. Um, a group of us all went to his funeral. A group of us were there when we withdrew care because there was nothing more we could do. Mm -hmm. um, we still hear from that family. Um, a lot of us do um, through cards, through texts. Sometimes they call. Um, it's just um, I tell part of his story when I teach about COVID uh, to my students. He will forever be ingrained in my mind, as his whole family will. And that's kind of part of that anger that Julie talked about when people were, if not outright denying, saying that this is just a cold, <laughs> you know, and here you were helping a young dad see children, his children for the last time. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that is his some whole, powerful His anger. whole congregation one time. Yeah. His whole congregation came to his window and we turned his bed around so that he could see them. And we had a phone so that they could talk into it and he could listen to them. And it was, it was such a surreal moment. Thank you for sharing that. One, one question uh, from the audience is, um, how do you feel about the lessons learned, or how confident are you in the lessons learned from this experience in terms of preparedness for a future event? I think we all learned a lot. I think there are a lot of good things that came from it. Um, I spoke to it a little bit earlier, but communication is huge. You can never over communicate. Um, and just having avenues for if something is needed or if, you know, maybe we don't feel like something is right, that people feel safe um, to speak up and say that. Um, we really had that throughout the pandemic. And so nurses really, really, really um, have a voice. And I think that, you know, if we ever go through anything like this again, um, they'll know that and, and we can kind of start, start from there. Do you think we went into a mode we should have always been in? It's like when I hear you talk, I'm thinking, well, that's how it should be, right? Did we go into a, some sort of a supersonic mode of how it should be? I think we were headed there. Um, I think it got us there faster. It got you there faster. Yeah. Listen, it's interesting. I was just going to share. I, I think, you know, that's such a good question because the next pandemic could look entirely different, right? Um, so there's a couple of things I would agree. Absolutely, communication is so huge to that. I'll be honest, I think there's things I've learned that I wouldn't do again, uh, mm -hmm. to be real frank too. And I think in terms of ways to do things differently and what that initial um, sort of communication and interaction needs to look like, I, I think there was so much rapidly changing. It was It was difficult to be present in the moment sometimes, and I, I personally think I regret that. I wish I was more present as we were going through those changes, sure. even though they were coming so quickly. I think you're just trying to move through it. Um, so there's definitely things I would do differently, but I think as um, an industry, we're, and, and to be honest with you, as a society, I think we're so much more prepared for what that could look like if it had to. Um, I don't know that we like it, um, but I definitely think we're prepared for it more. I have one question right here, Patrick. First of all, I just want to thank you all for your service. It's, um, it's incredible. I have a daughter. She's a nurse at New York Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Oh, wow. And I'm wondering what you're doing to take care of yourselves now, having lived through <laughs> this and continuing to live through this, and, and what you feel you can't do now in some ways, maybe because of the nursing shortage and you don't literally even have time, 
but what you wish you had or you need in order to take care of yourselves. Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> I'll start. I'm sure that there's probably a lot of comments about that. So, um, you know, I don't know that anybody did a great job at taking care of themselves during it. And, and I think it's, you know, you, you were so perfect. So my background is trauma neuro ICO. And um, I was at night shift bedside for about 10 years before I transitioned into a leadership role. And I, I will... I will also say this is, as new nurses, I give that piece of advice to all of our new grads, don't forget to take care of yourself. Um, because it took 10 years for all that to catch up to me to realize all the experience and the loss and the things that I had gone through as a bedside nurse, right? And now I think about our nurses that have experienced that during COVID. Everything I experienced in 10 years, they experienced probably in about six months. And I can't even imagine what that would look like and how to process that. So. I know what I process now, um, and I know the ways to take care of myself, and I've had to commit to that, um, which also means that I'm up at 4.30 in the morning, which I don't love, but I'm doing every single day because I'm a better person for it, right? Um, but what works for me is works different for others. And so I think that we still have a lot of healthcare professionals, nurses, respiratory therapists, all kinds, um, who are still trying to figure that out, no matter how many resources we may provide or show, there still has to be that internal piece when you're ready to make it. Um, and I think that's a big personal step for people who have truly been at the front lines of COVID for all these years is, is to recognize their own personal way of how to process that. When you ask about what we wish we had, you know, if I, I don't know if this is the right answer, but it's the answer I'm gonna share. When I think about, as a profession, when I think about what we need now most for people to heal, um, to be honest, really, is kindness. Um, I think right now we're struggling more so than anything is um, a very difficult society that is seeking healthcare, and it is very challenging for nurses on a daily basis because People are, are very unkind right now to people who are working very hard to try to save lives and to heal and to recover. Um, and, and maybe that is not experienced in all areas, um, but I think that is something, if nothing else, is that recognition of what our frontline healthcare workers have gone through and give them some grace as they're going through. <laughs> Siri doesn't know, neither do I. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the beauty of the watch. So, um, but that's, I, again, I, I don't know that that's the right, um, I don't know that that's the right answer, but it's something that maybe I um, personally, as a leader, feel like I'm plagued with a little bit right now. That's what keeps me up at night, um, is how my team members get through a shift with that recognition of the fact of the work that they're doing is pretty darn amazing. And they're pretty darn amazing people, so my two cents. I love what you said, and I'm only going to add that I think um, gratitude and appreciation is part of that, the key to that, and we're working really hard on helping um, all the healthcare team recognize and share and also receive that in a way that they can truly take it to their heart. So I think that's spot on. I agree with you 100%. Question here to your all's left. Hey, we're going to segue. Go back to where you were at the very beginning. When the communication was difficult, when the communication was inconsistent, when we were hearing this, then we were hearing this, then we were hearing this, how did you guys triage, because I'm academia, so we triage differently. How did you guys triage whom to believe, whom not to believe, and then how to communicate that to other people without saying, that guy's full of whatever. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you appropriately communicate the fact that that is indeed miscommunication when you're faced with this person who's a little bit bigger than I am mm -hmm. looking at, down at me with uh, uh, you know, not a good attitude? Um, how did you guys do it? Well, one thing I think is it, it comes from a, a platform of trust. You have to trust the people that, you know, are... are You know, it was like we were being bombarded 
And nobody was agreeing. I think we trusted each other. Yeah, Don't you? I think we trusted each that other. Make a Pardon me? No, I know. But I mean, just to get through, it was, I mean, just to get through every day. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We worked seven days a week and our phone rang all night long from other hospitals, you know, other care providers at other hospitals, you know, needing advice. And, um, so, I mean, so we you're, just, so we just leaned just, on each other. I, just in time, policy making, undocumented. I, yeah. It was kind of new. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you had no, you even, wild. you even know as an I academic. Think, uh, yeah. By and far, we just kind of rolled with the punches. We just yeah. kind of, okay, well, this is what the CDC says today. This is what we'll do today. Okay. <laughs> you know, we were just really striving to keep everyone as safe as we possibly could. Um, and yes, there was tons of different things coming from every avenue. You need to do this. No, wait, you need to do that. No, it's this variant. No, it's that variant. No, it's going to attack this type of person. Or no, it's going to, doesn't matter. You know, we just... Uh, just rolled with the punches and just tried our hardest every day to keep everybody safe and give as much knowledge as we could about what they, the people, um, um, the society could do to prevent themselves from contracting the virus. The hardest part was watching people use interventions that we knew would harm them yes. and really yes. believing in them. That was, for me, really we had hard. A, we had quite a few. Yes. And it was... Maddening. Yeah, I was angry. Yeah, I was as well. Well, I'm a nurse, but I'm in academia too, so. But my son was on the front lines as a nurse. So, I mean, one of the things I did with the lockdown was I taught myself how to sew, which was, and I made masks, and I also made headbands that I sewed, you know, buttons oh, yeah. on for people. Oh, those saved and, our ears. And yeah. he would take those to work, you I know, and put them out still. on the table, and they'd just, whoosh, 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 yeah. they'd be gone, gone, gone. But um, the, th the one thing that he kept saying was, is I have to go home and put my, I can't leave work. You know, how at the beginning it was, to be a nurse was great, but then as it went on, he said, I can't go to Target or Price Chopper with my uniform on after work because people accost me and tell me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it just really, he said it was so, it, it just, there was such a change of how, nurse, uh, of how nurses were viewed as the pandemic went on. And I just felt so bad for him for taking care of COVID patients all night and then people like looking at you like you have the play, you know, like you're, don't get by me, don't be by me. Yeah, I think another piece of that was, you know, we um, were taking care of these really sick patients in, in our hospital, but then we were going to Target and no one had a mask. Yeah. Um, and so that was incredibly frustrating and disheartening because we're taking care of patients that are dying in our hospital and no one will wear a mask in Target. And so I know that was something that was really frustrating for our team too. And dealing with the disinformation yeah. that was out there. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the same. I remember sitting, standing in the line at the DMV and we had to be outside because only like one or two could go in at a time. And of course we were way far apart from each other, but there was like three or four people ahead of me that were talking and I had nothing on that would you know, tell them that I'm a nurse. I was so infuriated. Mm -hmm. I, um, just the things that they were saying and I wanted to correct them, but I knew if I opened my mouth, it would not be good. And I, I just remember thinking, I don't understand why you people can't see what, what's happening in the world and what we need to do. And I just remember being so angry. And how, and how masks shifted from public health to politics yeah. very quickly and became a rallying oh, cry. Yeah. And the vaccine. And yeah. the vaccines. Yes, ma'am. We have one final question for this evening. I kind of have three different comments. My first one is that I want to thank the library for doing the Trinity Lutheran thing. My mother-in-law, uh, Ellen Miller-Idle, she graduated from Trinity. 
in the 50s, and she ended up being uh, head nurse on the overnight shift in the 60s. And then she went out to Grandview when her daughters went to high school. But she died young. So my pro what I'm asking is, back, uh, I took a job working for nuclear medicine so I can go in places in the hospital the public can't. And the one thing I noticed is when she was a nurse, all the nurses were white. <laughs> they had their pen on their lapel and they had their hat. Yeah. And now uh, it seems like the hospitals even supply you with your uni uniforms now. So that saves you out of pocket. And the last <laughs> thing I want to know is what percentage of men or nurses now? I, I can take that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Men leave the profession at a higher rate than, than women, though. And the um, students, I think it's a little bit higher. But it's interesting, yeah. So we haven't made a lot of strides in that over the years. Well, um, Goodness, there is no real good way to um, to wind this up, but this your your stories were remarkable, and um, you are heroes. But you are nurses, and nurses are heroes. And what I heard uh, very clearly is you are you were doing what uh, nurses do, and I thank you. And I thank all of you for um, coming tonight. And I thank all of you who uh, tuned in on our uh, video cast. And I'd like to thank the, um, uh, the um, Baptist Trinity Lutheran Legacy Foundation <laughs> for a lot of, lot of, lot of different uh, acronyms, a lot of mergers. Uh, for um, sponsoring this in the Kansas City uh, Public Library. And I just want to say on behalf of the library, it's been an honor to have all of you here, and thank you all, not just for tonight, and not just for the last two and a half years, but for everything you've done. Thanks again.